you are a Christian in the West, there are two dates that matter most, two dates in history that shape the way we think about our faith and specifically the way we think about the relationship between faith and culture. The first date was Easter Sunday. We don't know, of course, precisely when that occurred, but the second date we know with chilling precision, it was October 27, 312, the day when Christianity, as it had been known in its first three centuries, disappeared in the instant. I want you to imagine for just a moment that we are worshiping together on a Sunday morning in a church environment, but we're not in a church building because those haven't been invented yet. It's not the year 2015. It's not the 21st century, but it's the first century. It's 99 CE, or it's 200 CE, or it's 300 CE, and you are sitting in a worship service in a home or in a cave where there is a guard posted at the door or on the roof because at any moment it is a fact of life as a Christian that they could come for you. They could confiscate your property. They could throw you into prison. They could feed you to the lions. And the question that grips your heart in the middle of this worship service as you move through the liturgy and listen to the homily is not what you will have for lunch or whether you'll make it home in time for the kickoff. The question that burns inside of you is, do I allow my child to be baptized? Because if you allow your child to be baptized, your son or your daughter, when they come for you, they will come for them as well. And it is only a matter of time. One day, probably when you least expect it, if you are a Christian, the Roman government may come for you. This is the environment that produced the Christian faith as we know it. This is the environment that produced the New Testament. This is the environment which was all we knew, our Christian ancestors, for three centuries. And those three centuries represented some of the most explosive growth that any faith movement anywhere has ever seen. That environment was the all-powerful regime of the Roman Empire that threatened Christians on every side with imminent humiliation and death. And somehow, in the midst of these sporadic yet intense persecutions, by around 300 AD, the Roman Empire looked around and realized that their attempt to stop Christianity had certainly failed. They had not won the battle against the gospel. Instead, by around 300 AD, something like half of the population, particularly the population of the military, ironically enough, had converted to Christianity. Okay, hang with me, because this is where things start to get a bit hairy. The emperors realize that they can't just keep persecuting this movement. You can't kill off half of the population. That would decimate your tax base and the empire itself. So in the year 311, the imperial court issues what was called the Edict of Toleration, which said we're not going to resist or kill or persecute Christians anymore. We're going to tolerate them now. They're free to live their lives. They're free to worship in the way that they want. Imagine that. You don't need a guard on the roof anymore. You can baptize your child now without fear. I mean, it must have been an amazing moment to have been a Christian for the first time in your life. You're not living in fear of torture and death. Little did they know the rabbit hole that that had begun. Everything would change, and that change would happen literally just a few months later. So on October 27th, back to, in the year 312, back to our original scenario, there are two rivals to the imperial throne uh, the, of the Roman Empire. One is named Constantine, one is named Maxientius, and they are facing off with one another along with their armies at a famous battle called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. It had been seven long years since the former emperor, Diocletian, had died. And while the city of Rome recognized Maxientius as Caesar, all of the eastern provinces recognized Constantine as Caesar. And so it was decided as fate would have it that Maxientius and Constantine would have it out once and for all in a great battle that would decide who would be the emperor of the entire Roman Empire. These two candidates for emperor, emperor realized that they were fighting for a Roman Empire that had fallen into precipitous decline. Although holding absolute power over the Mediterranean world for almost 500 years by this point, it looked as if it might fully disintegrate. But Constantine was a saucy guy. He was a, an infamous pagan, himself responsible for persecutions of Christians. But he was also a savvy, if not brilliant, politician. And as he looked around for something that would unite this disintegrating Roman nation, this Roman empire that was about to break up, it dawned on him 
that no emperor had actually tried to use Christianity to the advantage of the Roman Empire. And so as Constantine's story goes, on October 27, 312 AD, the night before the great battle of the Milvian Bridge, he proclaimed to his troops that he had seen a vision in the night of the Christian God. And in this dream, he looked up to the sky and he saw either a cross in the sky or an ancient Christian symbol called the Cairo, uh, which is a symbol for Christ. And beneath whichever symbol he saw, the Latin letters appeared, in hoc sigmo vici, which means in this sign, conquer. Clearly, Constantine told his troops this was a message from the Christian God, that if they would kill Maxientius's troops in the name of Jesus, they would be victorious. And as fate and history would have it, the story worked. The vision worked. Constantine's troops were fully roused and ready for the battle. In fact, they painted crosses and chiros on their shields when they went to war the next morning. They won. And in response to this win, Constantine declared the conversion of of the entire Roman Empire to Christianity. This was an earth-shattering change for the Christian movement. Imagine, within about a year, we went from being persecuted by the nation-states of Rome to tolerated by the empire to being equated with the empire itself. So here's the question for us to ponder. Was this the best or the worst thing that could have ever happened to Christianity? For the first time, the Christian church is no longer in conflict with the state, but we were co-opted by the power of the state and its politics. Now, the state and Christianity, it's hard to distinguish between them. In many ways, they're one and the same. The church slowly but surely left the business of church things and got into the business of raising taxes and bringing up armies and border patrols and crusades and conquering lands and kingdoms, it was the moment perhaps that the gospel became conflated with nationalism. 